Welcome to The Bridge. We're glad you joined us. We offer many other Bible study, prayer, and fellowship opportunities throughout the week. We would love to have you attend one or several. On Sunday mornings at 9.15 a.m. is our adult Sunday school Bible study at the church. Currently, Joe Dankel is teaching through the Gospel of Matthew. On Wednesdays at 12 p.m. is our prayer service and Bible study at the church. Currently, Pastor Aaron is teaching through the Psalms. Pastor Aaron hosts Refuge Radio every Saturday morning at 9.10 a.m. on WMBS. Currently, he is teaching through the book of James. And on the last Sunday morning of every month, Pastor Aaron hosts Ask the Pastor at 9.15 a.m. before Sunday service. This is a great opportunity to bring your most difficult Bible questions for discussion. Resurrection Sunday is coming soon. We're celebrating the resurrection with a Good Friday service on Friday, April 7th at 6.30 p.m. and a Sunday morning Easter service on April 9th at 10.30 a.m. We'll be gathering together for breakfast before the Easter service at 9 a.m. All are welcome. Please make sure to invite friends and family to these special Easter events. Check out the church's new YouTube channel. The channel is called The Bridge Mason Town and can be found by typing The Bridge Mason Town in the search bar on the YouTube site or the mobile app. You'll find an easy, accessible archive of Sunday sermons on the channel. Be sure to subscribe to the channel to receive notifications of new uploads. In addition to the YouTube channel, recent sermon videos are now uploaded to the church's website under the Resources tab. The website and YouTube channel are great options for sharing with friends and family who are looking for a church to attend or to check out. Now, let's join Pastor Aaron as he continues in his sermon series in the book of Jude. church let's stand together this morning we're going to go to several different passages of scripture today Uh, i'm going to have you open to a couple different places we're going to go to jude 14 through 16 i want you to mark jude and then i also would have you mark luke 19 so go ahead and mark luke 19 in your bibles and then also go over to zechariah chapter 9 Zechariah chapter 9, and then after that, we're going to go to Zechariah 14. So Luke, or so Jude, uh, Luke 19, Zechariah 9, and then Zechariah 14. And as you're turning there, I'll give you a minute to turn to those scriptures. I just want to let you know the the sign-up list that you see kind of going around this morning, that is for the Easter breakfast. So if you did get a chance to sign up for that last week, this week, you can just jot down uh, how many's coming with you to that breakfast, what you'd like to bring with you, if you'd like to bring some kind of side dish or 
pancakes or eggs or anything like that, whatever you guys would like to bring, feel free to jot down there. And we're looking forward to having breakfast uh, together next Sunday for Easter. And then also some really cool news uh, for Good Friday service this coming Friday at 6.30 p.m. Actually, my good friend uh, Dana Wiles, Pastor Dana Wiles out at Covenant Baptist Church in Uniontown, he reached out to me. And he asked if their church could join us for Good Friday service. And I said, hey, amen. Yeah, the more the merrier. I'd love that. Uh, so I don't always get to worship uh, with my brothers uh, who are also pastors. So uh, looking forward to having those guys just joining us uh, in uh, worship that night. So it's going to be a great evening together. Amen. Uh, so if you got your Bibles marked there, we're going to go to Jude, then Luke, then over to Zechariah. And we'll start here with Jude 14. Uh, This is kind of a part two from last week, Uh, beginning in verse 14, Jude writes, It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him, these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. And then I want you to go over now to Luke 19. And let's pick it up in Luke 19 and verse 11. Jesus is uh, speaking here. It says, as they heard these things, he, speaking of Jesus, proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to, he was near Jerusalem, uh, to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. And then I want you to jump down to verse 27. But as for these enemies of mine, this is the conclusion to Jesus' parable, the king that returns, he says, verse 27, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say, The Lord has need of it. And then I want you to go down to verse 35 now. Go down to verse 35. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I love this, what Jesus says. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now let's go back to Zechariah from here. Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
And then I want you to go over to Zechariah 14 now. Same book, Zechariah 14. And the prophet writes, Behold, a day is coming. Verse 1. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. When the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile. But the rest of the people shall not, shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. So that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azel. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these passages of Scripture, these prophecies that have been given, some of them already fulfilled in your first coming, and the others shall be revealed at your second coming. Lord, we thank you that your word is true. Thank you, Lord, that none of your words will ever fall to the ground. Lord, all of your words are faithful and true. So we ask now, Lord, that you would drill your word deep into our hearts, into our souls this morning by your spirit. Give us illumination and understanding, Lord. Be our teacher now. And may we all walk away from our time together encouraged and built up in the faith and challenged from your word and more like you, Lord Jesus, and less like this world. Bless the preaching and teaching of your word now, upstairs and downstairs as we gather. We give you praise for it all, Lord. In your holy, holy name, Lord Jesus, we trust and we pray our King. Amen. You may be seated. So I've entitled today's uh, uh, time together, The King and His Kingdom. The King and His Kingdom. And you could even kind of subtitle this, Behold the Lord Comes Part 2, because we didn't finish last week, did we? Which is typical. We didn't get through it all. Uh, so this is kind of, this is really Jude uh, part nine in our current study in Jude. And as I've already stated, I've told you guys that uh, in weeks past that my intention is actually to stay in the little letter of Jude all throughout the Easter season. We're going to stay in this little letter. And we're going to stay through the, in this letter uh, for today and Palm Sunday, also through Good Friday and even on Resurrection Sunday. And I'm going to do this for two reasons. There's two reasons we're going to stay in Jude. Uh, I don't want to stop, number one, when we're this far along, right? We're, all, we're all right there. We've, we've come through this, and I don't want to just stop now. I think it would be awkward to do that. Uh, even more importantly, though, what I see in Jude, what really began to prod my heart is I see very strong, uh, very strong, scripturally uh, strong connections between what Jude writes on the accounts of uh, what Jude writes here also in uh, relation to that final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. And there's, there are two strong connections to really uh, to waste it when we're here. I don't want to waste the opportunity as I see these connections. Uh, I also, I, always in our study, what I see here and what I love when we go through books of the Bible is God's divine providence in it all. Amen? Uh, I've even heard some of you talk about how relevant uh, oftentimes when we're in certain books of the Bible, man, how this is uh, applying to us right now, what we're seeing, and we've certainly seen that throughout this study in uh, Jude very strongly. So I want to stay here. Uh, but, and for instance, what I want to do is I want to preface the fact also that my intention in reading all the texts that we've read this morning, there were several of them that we read, my intention in reading all these texts uh, that we've read is to not only see the highlights of Palm Sunday, since it is Palm Sunday, uh, including both the glory of fulfilled prophecy concerning Messiah's first coming, that's Zechariah 9.9, uh, and then I want us to see the tragedy of the national rejection of their Messiah uh, that's really uh, the tragedy of the religious leaders of that day. It is a national rejection of the Lord Jesus that falls at the feet of the religious leaders, doesn't it? 
and that's in Luke 19. But then I want us to also see, too, there's two other important truths on why we're staying here. Number one, the comparison to how the king came the first time in comparison to how he will come the second time. Amen? And then secondly, the striking similarities between the apostates that Jude warns us of, and I I couldn't get over this, how strong the similarities are, are between these apostates and these religious leaders that caused, really caused Jesus' tears over the city of Jerusalem. There's strong connection. Really, we could say, and I get, we could confidently say, that these religious leaders are really apostates. These religious leaders have the Messiah in front of them. They've had the covenants, they've had the law, they've had the word, they have the word manifested to, to them in the flesh. The word made flesh come down to them. This is God's one and only Son. And they walk away from him. They reject him. They mock him. They scorn him. And they want him put to death. These guys are apostates, abandoning the truth of Scripture. And you may have noticed also that both notice how Enoch, according to what Jude writes, Enoch and Zechariah, both of these guys, spoke of the second coming of Christ. And notice they spoke of the second coming of Christ so similarly, didn't they? They both speak of these holy ones, these angelic majesties returning with King Jesus to judge the world at his second coming. Zechariah prophesied from 520 to 470 BC. Enoch prophesied as the seventh from Adam in the pre-flood days with Noah being his great grandson. So they were kind of spread apart, weren't they? But God's word is a seamless story. It's just the supernatural masterpiece of the scriptures. Amen? The supernatural masterpiece that ultimately the Holy Spirit is the author of the whole entirety of the word of God. So they both prophesy the second coming of Christ, both speak of things so similarly. Zechariah tells us that the return of the king will be on the very same Mount of Olives that Jesus actually had ridden down here in Luke chapter 19 on Palm Sunday. The same mountain he comes down humbly in his last week on earth that will lead to his death. That same mountain he will come in glory and it will split in two. At his second coming. He comes to the city of Jerusalem. This is also the same Mount of Olives that Jesus very appropriately preached on. We noted this last week when he preached on the end of the age and his second coming. That's Matthew 24. And both Jude and Zechariah prophesied that the Lord, Zechariah said, my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Zechariah 14, 5, just as Jude notes that Enoch prophesied that the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones jude 14 imagine that these holy ones are the same again angelic majesties or the glorious ones that the apostates actually dare to blaspheme with their arrogant and their irreverent and prideful blasphemous babbles of boisterous boastful false teachings against the glories of almighty god and his kingdom jude 8 These are the defectors of the faith, I remind you. These who abandon the Lord Jesus Christ. They reject him. These are those uh, that, that were in Jude's day. They were infiltrating the church, creeping in unnoticed. They were also there on Palm Sunday, weren't they? They were also there on Palm Sunday before Jesus himself. They were also there in Zechariah's time, as he prophesied. They were uh, also there in Enoch's day. And guess what? They are still here among us in our day today, aren't they? And all of them will one day stand before King Jesus. They will stand before the king as he executes his just wrath and his final judgments against all the ungodly. But Jesus, I want you to know, is also a savior, isn't he? He is a savior, and so he comes the first time to seek us out, to save us, to make a way for eternal life. I want you to know that today, 
is the day of salvation. You could be spared the wrath of God if today you would, you would quit holding on to your sin and you would turn from your sin and you'd repent, you'd believe on Jesus and you'd call on the Lord. You could be spared the wrath of God. He came in his first coming to absorb that wrath, to pay your sin debt in full with his blood. He died for your sin. He was buried and he rose victoriously from the grave. That's his first coming. That is the way of eternal life. Jesus is the one and only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. Amen. And you can trust in him, you can be saved, but I'm telling you that that clock is ticking, my brothers and sisters, isn't it? And friend, friend, if you're, maybe someone even is watching right now, or you're thinking of a loved one who's lost, let them know, we must let them know, time is running out, and the second coming will not be like the first coming. The second coming, it will be far too late for having turned to the Lord Jesus Christ who mercifully came as the Lamb of God to lay down his life for you. Now he comes in his second coming as conquering king. And we know that no stone will be left unturned. When Jesus Christ came at his first advent, he came as the suffering servant of God to die. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the Jews, they were assuming though, a different kind of Messiah. Many of them ignoring what the prophets said in Isaiah 53 concerning the Savior. And the Jews are assuming something different now. They, are, uh, they have in their mind a David type of character, don't they? They're thinking of a Joshua type of character or an Elijah type of character, some kind of military Maccabean zealot type of figure. If you know anything about the Maccabees and the Judah, who Judah Maccabee is, they're thinking, we need our political leader. No, you don't. And brothers and sisters today, no, you don't. We see where our political leaders are today. I mean, you read the news today, both of them are idiots. I'm talking past and present, brothers and sisters. They have proven themselves to be false. I'm not hanging up my hope on the president of the United States. They let me down again and again and again. My hope is on Jesus. Amen. Just saying. And they, 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 they have in their mind, they have in their mind, though, these, these, these Jews, they're thinking of a, of a kingdom that's coming to overthrow the Roman Empire. To deliver them from the current Roman oppression. But Jesus came as a far greater king. A far greater king than all of that. Christ comes not as some political leader. Christ comes as king of kings and lord of lords. Knowing how you first and foremost need saved. Which is saving from your sin. He therefore came to suffer and to die, 1 John 2, 2, propitiation for our sins, satisfying the just wrath of God that we deserve. He hung on that cross that we deserved. He died the death that we deserve. And he was born in Bethlehem, Euphrata, therefore, Micah 5, 2, where the Passover lambs would be raised. And on the night of his birth, we know he's wrapped in swaddling cloths, just as those Passover lambs would be countless times before him. Then he's laid down in a feeding trough just as Passover lambs would be in pre preparation for examination by the priests. As John announced at the Jordan River, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, This is the Lamb of God. All the past lambs pointed to this Lamb now who's come. He was even born in one of those cave-like dwellings, the Tower of the Flock, according to Micah 4, 8 wherein Passover lambs would be born in the fields of Bethlehem, those very fields of Bethlehem that were donated by King David himself, part of his homeland being given to the designation of Passover lambs to be raised. And, and this is the point. This is what I'm saying. This is the whole big thrust here. The truth is Jesus came born to die, didn't he? He came born to die, born to lay down his life. No one takes his life from him. He willingly gives his own life, John 10. Well, over a thousand years later from David, it's Lamb Selection Day, isn't it? Lamb Selection Day, the baying of lambs could be heard all throughout the city of Jerusalem. 
the lamb selection day, the lamb of God has appropriately come now, inspect him, see him, he's going to be slain, and he is the perfect, sinless, spotless lamb of God. He comes into the city, fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, and as I traditionally ask you to do on Palm Sunday, guys, I want you to picture this scene with me. Picture this scene. Imagine yourself in the streets of Jerusalem with me this morning. Imagine the electricity kind of in the air in this moment, right? I mean, it fires me up to think about what a moment. What a perfect, almost like God planned it this way, because he does, right? He comes on the perfect day, perfect time. Matthew tells us, he tells us in uh, Matthew 21, 10 through 11, it says, when he, speaking of Jesus, entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. The whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And I love that line that the whole city was stirred up. Everybody's stirred by the coming of Christ as he enters the city. The word stirred, it comes from the Greek word uh, that we get our English word for seismic. Seismic, and it carries the idea of like an earthquake. An earthquake, uh, vibrations of the earth and its crust. It's, it's not a light description, is it? I mean, this was a big thing. It, it, it's no, so, no small stirring among the city. That's the idea that, the, that Matthew's painting for us. No small stirring. It was as if the whole city of David rumbles as the king comes to town, right? There are, it's rumbling, it's shaking, all Jerusalem's shaken up, the city's shaken up, the people are shaken in their hearts and in their lives, deep down in their soul. You need to understand, it was a packed city. And by the way, they're all waiting for Messiah. And this is the biggest point of, of Judaic calendar, Passover week, when the Lamb of God was to be taken, inspected by the priest and slain. All of Jerusalem was shaken. Everyone is shaken up. This was no doubt uh, a a massive moment uh, uh, for the Judaic calendar, a city full of Jews longing for Messiah to come, longing for these prophecies to be fulfilled. But it was the beginning of Passover week and the greatest highlight of the year for the Jews is what's happening. That's the account. Every gospel writer records the account, therefore. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all record uh, what happens on Passover. Uh, this day, and rightfully so. Matthew brings out the Old Testament prophecy in detail for the Jews. Mark gives us a brief, general, straightforward account. Luke gives us details of the context. John gets right to the heart of the matter concerning the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But each gospel account covers uh, this day that was unlike any other day on the Hebrew Judaic calendar. According to his historians, we know historians like Josephus, he records no less than two million people in the city of Jerusalem at this time. Two million people in this city. Uh, you get the idea, it was, it was packed, it was crammed, right? It's like, I mean, when you go to Walmart on Christmas and just everybody bumping elbows, like, it's like that everywhere. I mean, it's just jam-packed full of people. It's such a big event. And, and, and it's, it's lamb selection day, lambs being inspected by the priest for Passover. So not only is it packed, but the baying of lambs is everywhere. You would hear this all through the city, these lambs just baying all through the city. Scholars estimate that somewhere between 10 to 50 percent of the population was in Jerusalem uh, for Passover in those uh, times. Uh, The Temple Mount, we know, had even been expanded to hold the holy uh, holiday crowd, so it had been expanded at this time, especially for Passover. Roman rule had even made the travel safer for many, with an estimated amount, again, of at least 2 million people in Israel while Jesus was alive. Also, there was somewhere between, get this, 200,000 and 1 million people who had just come to Jerusalem for Passover the year that Jesus died. Each family bringing with them a Passover lamb for the slaughter on lamb selection day. You'll find this in Exodus 12, 1, the 10th day of Nisan. When you do the math, historians tell us that there was somewhere between 2 to 2.5 million Jews that were present in the city at this time. It is a packed city and then, of course, a massive wave of baying, massive wave of baying lambs Uh, to accommodate people who have come to uh, celebrate Passover this week. 
So as Passover week was now being prepared, Jesus comes to the city. The holy city flooded with all these Jews and all their family. We know that all the firstborn males, by the way, also within a 20-mile radius of Jerusalem were required under Judaism to be at uh, Passover in Jerusalem. It was a part of their law. And of course, along with them, there also came many family members that came. So that's no wonder it's so packed. On top of this, the truth, the Jews uh, in general, they would come to Jerusalem. As a a good Jew, you would want to come back to the city of David just to celebrate Jerusalem. So that was also happening. Uh, Now, over 1,400 years later from Exodus 12, this Passover is being celebrated. 1,400 years later since uh, the Passover was instituted, We know back in Exodus 12, they were remembering uh, that God had made a way for death to pass over their homes. You remember this in Egypt. Made a way for death to pass over their their homes to spare their firstborn. Long ago in Egypt, uh, they were remembering how that the conclusion to God's supernatural ten plagues that he brought on Egypt to deliver them from their slavery, it concluded with the blood of the lamb being applied to their doorpost, didn't it? And now here we are 1,400 years later. That very day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey in Jerusalem was the day that they called Lamb Selection Day. Peter writes, 1 Peter 1, 18-21, You were ransomed, he says, from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. In other words, you were saved from dead works. Not with perishable things, he says, such as silver or gold, uh, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. This was uh, the, the last time, brothers and sisters, Jesus would enter the city of Jerusalem before he would go to the cross on Friday. It's the last time he would enter the city but during his earthly life and ministry. It would conclude in Friday where he would die and then he'd rise from the grave on Sunday. And it's Lamb Selection Day. We also look at, we could examine the prophecy being fulfilled here. It, it's quoted from a very well-known messianic psalm, Psalm 118. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, or Hoshana, how, is that how they'd say that? Which means save now, save now. And that's exactly what they wanted, save us now. But what do they really want to save from? Roman oppression. It's like us Americans all the time getting hung up on, Lord, save us now from our political idiots. (laughs) You need a far better saving than your political situation. You need your soul saved. You need delivered from the wrath of God. You need your sins forgiven. You need someone to satisfy the wrath of God lest you have to pay for it on your own in an eternity in hell. Someone Someone else came to pay the bill. His name is Jesus. Psalm 118, this is what we started our service out with this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. A very well-known psalm that the children of Israel would sing as they would gather into the house of God and they would quote this song as they would enter into worship. A messianic psalm of Messiah to come. But all of this gets even better because as we referenced to last week, we just touched on this last week, that the prophet Daniel, in his vision of his 70 weeks prophecy, if you want to jot down Daniel 9, 20 through 27, I almost read this one this morning too, but I didn't want any longer list of scriptures. But Daniel 9, take this home and read it, 9, 20 through 27, and you find Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. Daniel, he's told that it would be 69 prophetic weeks from the going forth of the edict, and here's the edict, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. And that edict, we know this decree decree is given by King Cyrus of Persia. You'll find it in 2 Chronicles 36, 22 through 23. How about that? Daniel was right, right? 
He was right, because this is God's word, amen? Thus saith the Lord. God's word never falls to the ground. It always fulfills its purpose, right? The edict came out, 2 Chronicles 36, 22 through 23, just as Daniel prophesied, and after the seven-year uh, Babylonian captivity and exile from their homeland, Israel was actually told to go back home, go home, and get this, rebuild the temple, you get to rebuild the temple and they get to go home and they get to rebuild the temple and the prophetic clock of God, just as Daniel said, begins to tick, doesn't it? Begins to tick. 69 weeks. It's important to note that they're prophetic weeks, which in this particular context of prophecy meant that each week stands for seven years, exactly. Seven years. They were literally fulfilled. For it was exactly 483 years of 360 days from the going forth of that edict that was given, uh, get this, until Jesus rode into Jerusalem as Messiah publicly in his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. I mean, come on, church. To the date. I mean, you guys, this is amazing. This is amazing. Take this, please, to your skeptic, friends. And show them this stuff. Show them the amazing fulfillment of prophecy. To the day, what happens on Palm Sunday? Christ comes into the city. He comes into the city and he's hailed as the son of David. Hosea, Ho, Hosea, Ho, puh, Hosanna, eventually get it out. Hosanna in the highest. A messianic psalm. And it was evident, just as Daniel prophesied that what? Messiah, the prince, had come. Amen? You've got to fo follow, stay with me in this. This is so significant that we understand these scriptures. Messiah, the prince, came. He fulfilled Daniel's 70, 70, it's our 69th week prophecy. And then what happened? Well, next, it's very important to grab hold of. That's why we read through Luke 19 here. Within just one week, we know the Jews would have Jesus crucified. They will reject Messiah, won't they? God's prophetic clock at that point uh, kind of stops ticking, so to speak. It's put on hold. We have one more week for Israel, don't we? We do. You can't get around it. We have one more week that has to be fulfilled. If the other ones were literal uh, prophecies and what they meant, that we can't just you know, ignore this, the other one. It has to be fulfilled. It's the 70th week. There's one more time period of seven years that has to be fulfilled. And it's for, not the church, but the nation of Israel. And so in the meantime, we have a break, don't we? We have a break between the 69th, uh, prophets, the 69th week and now the 70th week. And there's a break here for the nation of Israel. Something happened. Well, Messiah came, just as Daniel said, a Messiah was cut off. They rejected their Messiah. The Holy Spirit now is working in this time and this frame that's, that's referred to in the Bible as a mystery. A mystery was something hidden and now revealed. This is what we call the church age. It was a complete mystery to the Jew. And it's at this time break, now he is gathering together both Jew and Gentile as one body in Christ. Amen? And he's making us one. And when this time is completed, according to the sovereign good purpose and plan of God, when this is full, when this time is run out, according to God's timing, the rapture will take place. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. The church is taken out. And why is she taken out? Because there's a week waiting for Israel. And it's time for that week to come. It's time for that week to come. The prophetic clock will begin to tick again. The nation of Israel will begin uh, to be drawn to Messiah right on time, right on schedule with God dealing with Israel through Daniel's promised 70th week prophecy or that last period of seven years. This has to be, this is no doubt, the seven year tribulation period, which is not for the church, but the nation of Israel taking us back to Daniel 9. And so as we saw last week, and as we said, in that context, Jesus laid out what will happen in that tribulation time frame. This is all in Matthew 24, which, by the way, uh, he's, again, speaking to Jewish disciples. They knew all about Daniel's prophecy, the church being a mystery, Matthew 5, 32, a mystery, something hidden now revealed. The rapture, therefore, by the way, is also a mystery. How do I know that? Paul said that. Imagine that, that just as the church is a mystery, so the rapture is a mystery. How do I know that? Write down 1 Corinthians 15, 51. This is a mystery. 
We're going to be changed, amen? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when the trumpet sounds, when Christ returns for his church, brothers and sisters, that could happen now. Nothing else has to happen before that. Which means if that can happen now and the tribulation period hasn't happened yet, you would have to, now you're getting mixed up in your theology here because now you're going to fit the tribulation period and you get all messed up. Have fun with that. Been there, done that. Now all I got to say is this. If nothing's preventing Christ from coming, then Christ could come now. And therefore I have to place the tribulation period following the rapture. And at that point we enter into what's referred to in the Old Testament as Jacob's time of trouble. Jacob's time of trouble, this has to be, no doubt, is Daniel's 70th week prophecy. Now stay with me, I'm building into these things here for this morning. The scriptures were clear, the tribulation, great trial, great judgment, the trying hour for Israel, it must happen, and it must happen before the Messiah's coming kingdom is ushered into this world. There's coming a day, brothers and sisters, where the king, like, it, it, this is no joke, he will literally rule and reign on this earth. I, I, I believe it. You guys, I mean, he, he's, like, there, this is what we're going to have. Like, I want you to think about this. There will be a capital city for the entire planet. That'll be Jerusalem. There will be one ruler, and his name will be Jesus. And everybody will be required to come before the king and worship him. And that those who live to be a hundred years uh, during the uh, millennial reign of Christ will be considered just a mere child. Uh, it's going to be incredible. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to all of these glorious realities. As a matter of fact, Israel was banking on this happening. They knew that these things were happening. They didn't know how it all fit. They had their assumptions. They were wrong about a lot of things. But they were banking on it. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, they're thinking this has happened. They're thinking that now the kingdom comes. Now he overthrows the world. But he comes fulfilling Zechariah 9, 9 first. And they assumed that he would overthrow the tribulation that they thought of, which was Roman oppression. However, let me tell you, the great tribulation period will be far worse than Roman oppression. The tribulation period will be far worse. We think sometimes we walk around like, oh, this must be the end. Let me tell you something. When you read through the book of Revelation, we ain't there yet, Right? I mean, it will be a time unlike any time the world has ever seen before when we enter the tribulation period. They, they uh, however, assume, they're assuming, okay, he's come, the king has come, he's going to throw over the Roman Empire, this evil empire that oppresses us. However, this was not their great tribulation, nor the trying hour yet. And it was necessary that Jesus first came as the humble Savior, as the Lamb of God, to lay down his life for the sins of the world. Isaiah 53, Genesis 3, 15, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21, 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 3 through 4. And it will later be that he will come as a conquering king rather than a humble shepherd and sacrifice. Revelation 19, the Messiah's kingdom shall come to the earth. And the fact is, God has his eye on the nation of Israel. He's not done with them yet. He has a covenant with them, everlasting covenants with them. Israel has therefore survived, get this, the Egyptian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persia Empire, Alexander the Great and his divided kingdoms, the Roman Empire, and even uh, risen from the ashes once more and recognized as a nation in 1948 following World War II, Hitler's concentration camps, alongside also the Six-Day War in 1967 when uh, they miraculously survived several nations who had risen up against Israel including Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon and yet this little sliver of a land is still the center of world news. Come on. They are a huge, significant part of God's prophetic calendar and he ain't done with them yet. And on Palm Sunday, what happens? Messiah was inspected as their lamb. He comes, he comes as the Lamb of God fit for the slaughter. He's recognized all their religious leaders, all their priests could see this is the Messiah, the prophecies he's fulfilled, the miracles he's done, the words that he speaks. He was recognized, even the people are recognized that they had more common sense than their religious idiot leaders, right? Clearly. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. At least they sang out praises. He was recognized as rightful son of David, king of Jews, their Messiah, Hosanna, the one who had come to save them. But now watch this. It was the religious 
leadership who had rejected him. That's why it's a national rejection. The leadership represents the nation. Amen? Boy, is that unfortunate for our leadership today in this nation. But I'm thankful that I am not represented by the fact that I'm an American. I am represented first and foremost that I am a Christian. And my, my, I stand in Christ, not in any other uh, identity. But these religious leaders, they rejected their Messiah. These were, the pro, these were the people everyone thought belonged to God. Doesn't that sound like Jude? Right? They thought these were, these are supposed to be the godly people. These are supposed to be our teachers. These are supposed to be the ones who know the word. So, so uh, just to quote Jude here, I suggest that these religious leaders were the apostates on Palm Sunday. They were the apostates on Palm Sunday rejecting the king, rejecting the word of God who was right there before them in Jerusalem, clearly as the king, clearly as their Messiah. They were right there with the word in their mouth, but not on their hearts. They knew it up here, but they didn't have it in here, did they? There are many people sitting in church all around the world today who have it up here, but they don't have it in here. They don't walk with God. Their hearts are far from him. And it will be brought out eventually. They were right there in contrast to the praise of others before Jesus, looking to draw the people. What did they want to do? They wanted to draw people away from the Christ. Isn't that what the apostates do? They want to get a following, and they want you to follow them away from Jesus, not to Jesus. The Christ, this was the Christ himself. God's law was on these religious leaders' tongue, though. Like they even knew the law. And they had added all kinds of laws on top of that to burden the people and to try to make themselves look better than they were. But they were not of the truth. They loved, John tells us, they loved the praise of man more than the praise of God. John 12, 43. For the, they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. John recorded why the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to make plans to put him to death. This was already in John eleven forty five 45 through 53, following the resurrection of Lazarus, when Christ raised Lazarus from the grave. They didn't want to lose their place under the political powerhouse of Rome. See, what these guys wanted, they didn't want Jesus, they didn't want God, they didn't care about God, they didn't even care that he was the Messiah, they rejected it, all they cared about was their position in this world of power. Now, is that not the apostates? Isn't this what we've learned throughout our whole time in the little letter of Jude? This is what apostates do. They forsake the word of God when it is presented to them, they abandon the truth, for a lie, and then they even try to, they, often, they inevitably become false teachers who will lead people astray, not to Jesus, but away from Jesus. That's exactly who these people were. And as everyone is celebrating the king, rather than joining the celebration that, yes, this is Messiah, here they are, wanting to lead people away from him. We can't have this. Matter of fact, that's what they say in John 11. We can't have everyone believing on him. Why not? That's like a good thing. John tells us they were snakes, though. He records in his gospel. John called them snakes, John the Baptist. Jesus also called them snakes, vipers, whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones, hypocrites, wearing a mask who long for the approval of men. They're blind leaders of the blind, uh, leading others to the ditch. They were enemies of Christ, enemies of the gospel, blasphemers of the Holy Spirit, sons of their father, the devil. They were Caesar's friend. They weren't Christ's friend. They wanted Messiah dead. They wanted him cut off, out of their sight, put away, silenced, all because they wanted to maintain their little position of power and influence in this political realm of Roman oppression. But Jesus had already told them, this little thing you have going on here, guess what, 70 AD, it's going to crumble, and it did. All of this sounds like Jude's descriptions, again, of the apostates. They have the truth set before them, but they forsook the truth. Let me tell you, do not forsake the truth. Do not walk out of these doors and think lightly of anything that's been said here this morning. Amen? Keep your heart close to the truth and make decisions concerning it, but don't walk away from it. Don't forsake it. 
Don't abandon Christ. Don't abandon it for your own gains and sensual carnal appetites and pleasures in this world. Well, mark it down. People do not reject Jesus for lack of evidence. They reject Jesus for their own lack of repentance. To let go of this world, to let go of their sin, to let go of their pride. And that's exactly what these religious leaders do. So hence, what does Jesus do? Well, we read here in Luke 11, he wept, didn't he? He wept over Jerusalem. He weeps over Jerusalem on his way down the Mount of Olives and into the city. Luke 19, 41 through 44. This is much like David weeping as he went up. He goes up the very same mountain as the rejected king, leaving behind the city, uh, behind him at the conspiracy of Absalom, 2 Samuel 15, 30. But now the son of David comes down the mountain into the city and he too weeps. He too is rejected as the king, but through his rejection, salvation will come to all humanity that would believe on him. And let me tell you, I I often wonder if our Lord weeps over those who appear to be for God in this world, but they prove to be the enemies of Christ. As he looks forward to their punishment of judgment and wrath that now lies ahead of them. You see, when you see this weeping of Jesus here, I I want you to to realize this. This isn't a self-pity weeping. This is a weeping as Jesus comes down the city and and he pauses and he looks over Jerusalem and he weeps. He is a mourning for what now will befall them, which is judgment. It's a weeping for them. Amen? This isn't a weeping for himself, it is a weeping for them. It will be far worse, by the way, the judgment that awaits these people who reject Christ as Messiah and King and Savior of the world. It'll be a far worse judgment than what happened in Jerusalem in 70 AD. It'll be much worse. Zechariah said this, Zechariah 14.9, that text we started with this morning, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. That has to happen. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Zechariah also writes, he says, the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. Their tongues will rot in their mouths. Zechariah 14, 12. So with all that in mind, there's, there's three simple truths for us to consider this morning, which are these three things in relation to Jude 14 through 16. Christ came the first time, and he wept over those who had rejected him. Number two, Christ will come the second time, and there will be those who weep for having rejected him as he exposes them for who they are. And then thirdly, the time is now, therefore, to surrender to him and receive him as Lord before it's too late. You can know him as shepherd, savior, as your Lord and as your king, or you can meet him as your righteous judge as he brings down the hammer. But one day you're going to come face to face with Jesus. You need to make a decision. Amen. Peter says the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. As some count slowness, he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. It's coming. Whether you're ready or not, it's coming. And notice that, that, that at his first coming, how he weeps over the city. And I want to say a few things about his weeping here. He really did weep here over Jerusalem to weep. This is what it means to express sorrow, grief, anguish by an outcry. It means to, to even moan, to, to wail. It is a, to manifest an express of grief and outcry by shedding of tears. Jesus wept in that way over the nation of Israel. This means this. He wept, wailed, moaned, cried over this city and over this people. See, th- this wasn't a weeping of sorrow again of self-pity. It was a weeping of sorrow for what now would come. And there's at least three times, I wrote down three times in the Bible where Jesus cried, where Jesus wept. Number one, he wept here over Jerusalem. That's Luke 19, 41. Number two, Jesus also wept, we know, at the graveside of Lazarus, didn't he? Before he raised him from the dead, John eleven thirty five. 35. And then Hebrews 5, 7 tells us this, that Jesus, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. 
And this alludes probably to Jesus' time in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's preparing to endure the wrath of God, to drink of the cup of the wrath of God from his Father. And he says, thy will be done. And what amazes me about Jesus' tears, what I really want you to think about this morning concerning his tears on Palm Sunday, is not only the fact that he sympathizes with me in my sorrows as my great high priest, uh, Hebrews 4.15 But what amazes me about Jesus' tears is how his tears are always selfless, aren't they? So selfless. He wept over Jerusalem. Why? Because they would now suffer judgment. And these who rejected him would suffer judgment. He wept at Lazarus' funeral because people around him were weeping and they were hurting and they were experiencing the sting of death, as the Bible calls it. And he entered into that sorrow with them. And then he weaves a Gethsemane because he knew that he must do what none other could do as he would go to the cross for our sin. And let me tell you, Jesus weeps for you. He weeps with you this morning. Maybe you're here and that's exactly what you needed to hear. That Jesus not only feels your pain, but he comes alongside you in your pain and actually weeps with you. He weeps for you. He weeps over you. He even wept over his enemies. Wow. We might weep over our children. We might weep over our friends. But do we weep over a city that rejects us? Because now what will befall them? That's what happened with Jesus here. He wept over a city that rejected them that now judgment would befall upon. He wept for them. You know, I was talking about this yesterday on Refuge Radio. And we know, you know, a few thoughts here from the Covenant School shooting. Private Presbyterian, a private Presbyterian school, uh, this is in Green Hills neighborhood of Nashville, Tennessee. A transgender woman breaks through the glass, shooting through the glass. She shoots and kills six people in premeditated murder. This included three adults. There were two female, ages 61 and 60, one male, age 61, and three nine-year-old sweet little children. You know, and as I thought about this, you know, the next day I'm walking my little girl to school and my boy to school. My daughter, who's also nine, she's going to be 10 here in May. I too am a pastor. My kids go to private Christian school. And my, my heart is heavy as I'm thinking about, I, could, I would be losing my mind if I was this man. I could not imagine the grief of the Shrugs family, particularly, and I could really relate with them, all of them hurting. But one of these little girls, Holly Shrugs, the daughter of Pastor Chad Shrugs from Covenant Presbyterian Church is killed. He stated in a statement, he said, through tears, we trust that she is in the arms of Jesus who will raise her to life once again. You know, not, not only, the truth is, not only does the Shrugs family weep, brothers and sisters, but Jesus weeps. He weeps over Howley. He weeps over Chad and his family. He weeps over these who've lost loved ones. He weeps over the horror of the sin of this world when they reject him. But now what, what, what will befall him? What befalls that transgender woman also? But Jesus weeps for little Hallie. He weeps for her family. Jesus even wept over this city who had rejected him. Think about that. And let me ask you, what makes you cry, church? A lot says about you and what makes you cry. You can, you can, everything, that's right. You can tell who a person is by what makes them cry. And Jesus really is a savior here. That's what you see in his tears, don't you? You you, you understand? The fact that he stopped and he paused and he realizes what's going to happen now and what's coming, knowing all these things, rather than celebrating himself or celebrating the praises of Hosanna, he stops and he pauses and he looks over a city that's rejected him and takes the time to cry for them. It says a lot about who he is, doesn't it? He's a savior. It tells a lot about a person and what makes them tears. Do you weep? Let me ask you, do you weep for the lost? Do you weep over the thought that men and women will suffer the wrath of God in eternity in hell if they reject the Lord Jesus Christ? And don't get me wrong, don't don't misunderstand me. We rejoice when the hammer of God falls down in righteous judgment. Amen? 
We rejoice in that. Proverbs uh, 29, 2, because we know God is good. The Bible says, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. When the, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. However, at the same time, we need to lay alongside of that Ezekiel 18, 23 that says this. God says, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? So as Jesus makes his way down the Mount of Olives, he pauses, he weeps for these who rejected him. And the context is national rejection. These religious leaders, flawed, spiritually blind, arrogant, hard-hearted, crooked, corrupt, hypocrites. They rejected the king who had come to actually save them from their sin. So Jesus mourns over the fact that they did not know the time. Also notice the day of their visitation. The day, this refers to, Bible scholars agree, and I agree as I looked at this, the day referring to the day Daniel spoke of. That's the day here. What day? Well, the day of Messiah the Prince being revealed to you. Wow. You failed to recognize the day that Daniel spoke of. This is your day. And by the way, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. What day? The day that we realized, the day Christ was revealed as Messiah for the world to see. This is the day that we know this Palm Sunday that he was unveiled and inspected to be the Messiah that was promised to come. Daniel's promise being fulfilled. Because if we know this day, we can know this Christ. And if we know this Christ, we are spared the other day, which is the day of the Lord. The coming day of wrath that also will come. So this is your day was important because it was likely, again, that day prophesied by Daniel, the Messiah, the Prince, would come to Jerusalem. Daniel said it would be 483 years of the Jewish calendar from the day of the decree to restore, rebuild Jerusalem. You can do the math for yourself and figure that out and you'll find this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. But now judgment would come. Soon, 70 AD, Jerusalem would fall. And that did indeed happen, just as Jesus said it would happen, Matthew 24. But this is why I also read to you this morning, Zechariah 14. Because that also will happen. There has to be a time, and there will be a time, where Jerusalem will be regathered according to the book of Revelation. It will be from every tribe, from all around the world, regathered, a new temple rebuilt. And the Messiah reigning upon the throne of David over the world with Jerusalem as the capital city over the entire planet. And all of this leads us back to Jude, doesn't it? And this is all the time we have for it. We come back to Jude, verses 14 through 16. Notice the, se- the contrast of the second coming. That's the Savior he is. That's the Savior. That's how he came to you. That's what he's willing to be for you, to weep over you, to save you, to make you his own. To shed his blood for you at Calvary, as we'll talk about Friday. To go to the cross and suffer the wrath of God that you and I deserve. You could know him in such a, such a way as this, but if you do not know him and you reject him, let me, let me tell you, he weeps over you because he knows the day that now comes. The day that comes, as Jude ta- tells us, as Enoch prophesied, Jude tells us of what he prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convince, to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He's going to expose them. How? That they are ungodly. They have done ungodly things and he's going to expose their ungodliness as he brings down the hammer on their ungodliness for they are ungodly. And without going into too much detail, I'm sure some of you are itching to wonder what I have to say about the pseudophysical books here. Pseudophysical books, these are books that were basically meant to inscribe falsely. They were books that were collected One of them was the book of Enoch that Jude actually actually quotes from here. In short, let me say without, because I know I'm running out of time here, that doesn't give any uh, acknowledgement of those pseudophysical books being inspired at all. It doesn't. Because there's false, there's, there's, there's history that was, some of it was true mixed with a whole lot of stuff that wasn't true. They're not inspired. That's why they weren't added to the scriptures. 
And they shouldn't be added to the scriptures. But all it tells us, as Jude writes of here, as he pointed out in his letter, he he referred to things that were well known among the Jews and among the people. One of those things, evidently, was Enoch's prophecy that that got recorded. And he just points out the fact that this actually happened. So basically, uh, he, he happened to record that in the book of Enoch, who... Uh, th- these were not, there wasn't Enoch who wrote that book, by the way, in the pseudophirical books, if you know anything what I'm talking about with the book of Enoch. But I just want to point out to you that that doesn't give any acknowledgement to those books, the pseudophirical books as scripture. It just means they got one thing right <laughs> along the way. But notice the Enoch, the bottom line conclusion concerning his prophecy, though, is this. Behold the Lord's coming. That's the big idea. And that's what I want to leave you this morning with. I want to leave you with the, with the, this morning with that reality that you could know him as the Savior who weeps for you and, and receive him that way and know his grace that he offers you and the mercy he offers you and receive him as Lord and know that this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day of salvation for Messiah the Prince has come. You could know him that way, but if you don't, I'm telling you, he's coming again and you will, you will know him as a conquering king with a rod of iron in his hand. Amen? Here's the big idea. And as I said before, wherever you land in eschatology, we all agree on this, amen? Be ready. Stay awake. Behold, the Lord comes. Behold, he's coming. He comes quickly. And I I say, even so, come Lord Jesus. I, I love, I'm with John on that, right? Come Lord Jesus. I'm not holding on to this world. I am held by Christ and I'm looking forward to what's to come. But the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones. These are the angel armies of God. These blasphemers that blaspheme the angelic majesties will be judged by the angelic majesties. They come to execute judgment on all. No one's going to escape. No rock unturned. No place for anyone to hide. Mountains split in two. The sky lit up with the glory of Christ. Trumpet blast sounding the alarm that the king comes to judge. Birds of the air told to gather to pick at the flesh of God's enemies. This day's coming. Notice Christ and his holy ones are coming to expose these apostates for who they really are. And this is, we come to the end now, convict. He's going to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And these are the grumblers, the malcontents, those who follow their own sinful desires, and then he explains what those sinful desires are. They are loud mouth boasters. Boy, if that doesn't sound like the Pharisees. Loud mouth boasters. They're on the list. They're, they're part of the grumblers. How do I know that? Well, Luke 19, 39 through 40. What, what was it that some of the Pharisees, notice there in Luke 19, what, what was it some of the Pharisees in the crowd began to say to him? They said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Everyone's celebrating. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And here are these grumblers. They say, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And if I was one of the disciples, I would be everything. I, I, I wonder if it's somewhere there where Peter just said, shut up. <laughs> These guys always button in. Do you realize who this is? That's my little insert. But they said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answers them. Jesus just looks at them and he says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. What a sight that would have been. Amen. Amen. Hosanna. All these rocks just begin to sing. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus could have made the rocks sing. But these are the grumblers, the malcontents. This means they are dissatisfied, troublemaking rebels. That's who the religious leaders were. Let me tell you, there's many of those in the church today. There's those who who want, they just want their sinful desires. They want to be propped up. That's what the apostates wanted. That's what the religious leaders wanted on Palm Sunday. They just wanted to prop themselves up. They just wanted the power. They were power hungry. They wanted to spotlight, not the Messiah. These are the partial showers of favoritism to those uh, who uh, they, they, they get some kind of advantage over to use for their own gain. Isn't that what we see, continue to see with the apostates? And isn't that what the religious leaders were always after? But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, Jesus said, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to, jo- to go in. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across the the sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. That's who these people were. And boy, we're out of time. So we're going to stop there and stand. I I could keep going, but I know I need to stop. Bow our heads. Close our eyes. The bottom line conclusion is this. You can know him as the one who weeps over you and for you. And you could surrender your life to him. Believe on him as Lord. Trust in him. Receive the mercy and the grace that he offers you now. Or you can procrastinate, or you can rebel, or you can walk away from him. But if you do that, you will not get to experience this day. You will know him in another day when he will not come to you with weeping tears, weeping for you, but he will come to you with a rod of judgment and wrath. And he will expose you for who you are. Or you could repent and turn to him now and know his mercy and his grace that he will offer you in saving you. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever your story is, however you've sinned against him, he shed his precious blood to wash your sin away, to make you his own. And the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. He is a compassionate Savior. He's willing to save you. He weeps for you. He weeps with you. He will weep alongside you, a compassionate Savior. But he is also a conquering king prepared to expose you and judge you if he has to, and he will if you reject him. The day of the Lord will come. But he calls for us all right now to surrender to him. But as for those enemies of mine, Jesus said, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. You can be his enemy, or you could be his surrendered servant and become a son or daughter of God today, covered in the righteousness of Christ, sin forgiven through the blood he shed for you at the cross, forgiven of all sin and made God's own. Heads bowed, eyes closed, wherever you're at, however you need to respond to the Lord, you do that this morning. If you're lost, you're not yet a Christian, I would encourage you, I invite you, become a Christian today. Don't wait any longer. Turn from your sin, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him. Surrender your life to him as Lord. Ask him to forgive you of your sin and to become your savior today and save you. And he will. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Respond to the Lord however you need to this morning. Father, we bow our lives before you once more. We thank you that we have been adopted into your family through the finished work of your son. Father, we know that there are many who do not know you. Many who walk around in ongoing rebellion against you. 
They cleansed their fist towards heaven as we once did. We know that you could save them just as you saved us. And we trust your will to be accomplished in this world, God. We pray for those around us, however, that are lost and that are in rebellion against you, that do not know you, that are facing the wrath of God and eternity in hell. We pray for them, Lord, that they would come to repentance and faith in you, Jesus. We pray, Lord, for any in this room right now, in this sanctuary, anywhere in this building maybe, that maybe do not know you. We pray that today would be the day that they'd come to know you. Save them. Save them now. Hosanna, save now. Save them right now from their sin, I pray. Draw their hearts to yours. Lord, bring, bring them the forgiveness that they could know and trusting in you as their Savior. And Lord, I pray that right now they'd turn to you and receive you as Lord and be saved and forgiven of all sin. We thank you, Lord, that there is no more shame over the beloved children of God. There is no more shackles of shame for you removed it all, Lord, when you went to the cross for us and you declared it is finished. Thank you, Jesus. But we know time is ticking. We know that you come as the righteous judge, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And with this little bit of time we have left, Lord, help us to reach the lost with the compassion that you demonstrated over the city of Jerusalem as you wept for it, Lord. May we weep for the lost and have compassion for those who do not yet know you. And Lord, may we take them the gospel this week. We commit it to you in faith, Lord. May you bless this church, Lord. Speak to us however you need to speak to us, Lord, as we sing and as we part ways. And we thank you, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Sing with us before the throne.